Hello. Hi. How are you doing? I am well. How are you today? Oh, good. Is everything working on your side? Um, I think so. Oh, I'm not able to get my video on. Oh, there we go. No. Yeah. Hello. Hi. Hi. Um, let's just test maybe the slides if everything, uh, like the share and everything works. We have a bunch of minutes. I think it's okay, but. Okay, let me try this. Can you see? Perfect. Let me try full screen mode. Very okay, good. Very great. Good. Yeah, you're now already the third speaker, I think, in uh, in our series. So we hope to keep this as a tradition. Mm, uh, that's great. Uh, we have uh, we have regular seminars in economics and so on and so forth, but almost nothing in urbanism before. So uh, it's it's truly a first uh, for Ukraine. Both our program, I you know, I wrote you that we're launching this 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 program, but also perhaps a platform where people can you know find out new things about how cities are built, how cities are managed, uh, and so on and so forth. So we had uh, Professor Shoup, mm. and that, that was uh, that was really nice because Kiev has a huge traffic problem, and okay. obviously parking and how parking is set up and so on and so forth was, was part yeah, of it. We, yeah. He's amazing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's 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 always great to, to hear to, to hear him uh, deliver this. I mean, he's he's really passionate and also insightful. I mean, I've I've learned a bunch of things. Uh, I always thought, okay, let's just give people money in a sense to avoid using cars. And, and you know, his argument was, no, let's we have to have parking, but but try to encourage use of alternative transportation. But there are situations where people really need to have the car. So. So there's no backlash in, uh, in, mm. in by taking away all the parking spots and so on and so forth. So yes, some things are very well thought through. Um, we had another talk on uh, post-catastrophe um, development. Um, okay. That was um, uh, Jorge Ramirez and um, David. Uh, oof, I almost forgot. It's okay. Yeah. So will most of the people who attend today be learning about tactical urbanism for the first time? Some of them, I think, uh, I mean, it, it depends a little bit on the mix. We generally have uh, students um, uh, every now and then we have some architects, some urbanists, and sometimes we have also activists in the urban sphere, and some of them have have seen this at work. So just just so you know, for example, right before the war uh, in Kyiv on selected days, the main street, the main boulevard would be closed and there would be uh, events there with people singing, dancing uh, and, and so on and so forth. So, you know, this 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 sort of a pop up pop up idea coming in. So I think they, in a sense, many know uh, how these how these things, uh, what these things are. Mm -hmm. uh, but of course, there's, you know, there's so much more to it. Uh, so that's why I thought it would be really good to have you and, and tell us because, so, you know, the cities that exist now without substantial damage face a lot of pressure from internal migration and, and so on and so forth. Right. Um, cities and communities and towns that have been severely affected, they will have to be redeveloped. But the principle of building back better, uh, you know, there's so many angles to that. Uh, it's not just infrastructure. Yes, we want efficient housing and, and, and solar panels and stuff like that. You also want the thriving city. Otherwise, you don't have people. You don't have retail. And and I think there it's, you know, there's a long way from what's there to what could be done. Right, um, right, right. Okay, great. Well, I, you know, I'm not an expert at rebuilding after wars, but I certainly have some examples that I think today I'll share that are more sort of classic Catholicism and then like how those ideas and principles have translated to responding to, you know, crisis, right? So I'll give a couple examples of that and some of the principles and lessons. And I think it'll just help open up the discussion. I'm, I'm That's uh, very good. curious to learn from, from the questions, what people are dealing with, because obviously I'm not on the ground and dealing with the challenges that you are. Yeah. Yeah. I think let's just wait maybe one or two minutes and then uh, we can perhaps, you know, 
get to it. So in, in Kyiv, is there, you know, I know the damage has been a lot less, you know, um, it's been lighter than many other parts of the country. Has there already been rebuilding taking place? Well, I mean, you know, the 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 outer skirts, the, the communities that have been severely affected, uh, you know, they've been cleaned up. But we've had an urban uh, redevelopment school and we've had students going to uh, to Bucha, to Irpin, to take a look at what's going on. Mm -hmm. There is temporary housing okay. uh, that's, you know, um, sort of a housing those who are there. Uh, there's a lot of work on the infrastructure side, so electricity, water, internet. Mm -hmm. um, and, and then there's critical points are, are, are let's say, um, are being taken care of, such as particular uh, highway connections, junctions, bridges. Uh, but, but there's a lot to do. So it's, uh, you know, there's priorities and, and the situation is not completely uh, stable. So you, you right. have, to have, you know, everything built up just to have another column of tanks potentially showing up. So this, um, let's say that it could, it could go faster if the military situation were um, calmer. Right, sure, um, understood. Okay, so I think uh, you know slowly we can uh, we can start if that's okay with you. Sure. Yeah. Okay, so um, welcome everybody. It's uh, great to uh, welcome Michael uh, Michael Leiden. Um, he is principal and co-founder of uh, Street Plans. Um, it's an urban planning, design, and research uh, advocacy firm. Uh, I've learned about uh, Mike's work through an initial um, book. I think it was probably one of the first books I read about tactical urbanism. I think this was a collection of lessons learned and, and ways to think about tactical urbanism. Um, some of us who've, who've visited Kyiv during, uh, during the Sundays before the war would see that Hreshatik would be closed down and we would have you know, uh, music and, and food stands and so on and so forth. So this is one intervention in which the city becomes, uh, gets, you know, takes away the cars, brings in the people and uh, becomes more livable. There are many such interventions, uh, some temporary, some uh, permanent. And it's a great pleasure to have uh, Mike with us uh, today to share his experience. Uh, as I was telling Mike before, you know, we have in a sense, two sets of priorities. We want to uh, improve existing cities where the infrastructure hasn't been uh, severely damaged. Most of these cities were suffering already before from traffic congestion, uh, congestion and so on and so forth. Uh, and perhaps to, to understand a little bit how we think about livable cities, about communities in those places where stuff has to be rebuilt from, uh, from scratch. Uh, so Michael, the screen is yours. Um, you know, I think we can uh, take questions and comments uh, after your, uh, your presentation. That sounds great. Thank you. And um, good afternoon to all of you. It's morning here in New York City, but good afternoon to those of you in Kyiv and, and elsewhere in Ukraine. Um, I'm very pleased to be here with you today. Um, you know, I think I am not an expert at, as I said earlier, I'm not an expert at recovering from war and the specifics of that. And, you know, my heart goes out to all who are dealing with this issue in so many different ways, politically and personally. And, you know, the health of your, your country and your cities is at the top of mind for all of us here in, in, in New York and in the West. Um, but with that, you know, I think there are some lessons that I can share, some principles I can share that might be applicable uh, for those two key scenarios um, that were just laid out. Um, but first, you know, who, who am I? Um, you know, I have a company that I started with my partner, Tony. We have an office in Miami and one here in New York City, which is where I'm based. Uh, we are an urban planning design implementation firm. We really focus a lot on the spaces between buildings, so streets and public spaces. Um, we do a lot of things like formal planning documents and coming up with ideas and visions for long-term projects, but really try to connect those to the more immediate projects that can be done at a lower cost and be more responsive to ever-changing conditions on the ground, which you know, every city has to deal with those. And so we've built up this practice that we've, you know, I'll explain in a little bit called tactical urbanism. So four goals for this conversation today is to increase your familiarity with tactical urbanism. It's to uh, understand how it can be used as part of the larger planning and uh, urban development delivery process. You know, tactical urbanism is not 
and, and, and to itself, it really does serve a larger vision and purpose of making more livable cities. And so it's a tool in that field of work. Um, I hope that some of the content shared will spark ideas about how this is relevant to uh, recovering and rebuilding cities across Ukraine. Um, and then through that practice on the ground, that you help us widen and deepen the practice and share what you learned back and share your examples and successes and, and, and failures as you would, might take this approach and apply it um, to where you all live, work, and advocate. So at a, at a very high level, you know, I think this is one of the, the planet's missions in cities is to help decarbonize our cities and how to then humanize them. Um, you know, there's all sorts of ways to do that. This is just one way we propose for Broadway uh, through the Soho neighborhood in, in New York City. So going from pretty chaotic traffic filled streets to ones that are much more calm and pedestrian friendly and oriented with a lot higher quality public space. Now I can tell you firsthand whether you're proposing something like this in Soho here in New York or in Los Angeles or in Paris or in Kiev, there's always going to be people who push back immediately on that change. And so really what we're involved with is, um, is change making through a very highly political processes. And that is a, a process and that's a timeline that is very long and difficult to overcome. And so we use these tactics, um, which I'll describe in a little bit to help overcome the, the immediate fear of change and the pushback that we get for proposing more livable cities. Um, for this reason, the stat is always kind of shocking, but it's kind of the the truth of urban planning is that most plans don't get implemented, right? They remain static documents, as ambitious or exciting as they may be, as well informed from the public as they may be. Um, but it's really hard to kind of leverage those planning documents into true change making on the ground in, in cities. Uh, here in the United States, uh, you know, for far too long, we've been focused on very large scale projects, you know, government projects that are very expensive, um, very difficult to build, and oftentimes because of their long timelines have uh, decreased the public's trust in the government to deliver projects that serve them. And because they're so large and such big investments, they're static and inflexible, they're hard to change once they're built, they're there for many generations, and it becomes a way to lock in, in this case, an image, auto dependency, and unlivable ways of thinking about transportation um, across you know, our cities in the US. And this is just a picture of Miami from the 1950s with a highway being built through the middle of a neighborhood. Um, and so we're still dealing with that impact and that lack of trust, which again is part of, partially why you get people you know, pushing back on, on projects and proposals. So Jane Jacobs, a very famous um, thinker and writer about cities said that city planning lacks tactics for building cities that work like cities. And I think what she means by that is cities are at their best when there's many, many, many contributors, many small hands, small projects, small shop owners getting engaged in making what turns out to be kind of a, a messy environment, but one that is very dynamic and supportive and democratic um, at the neighborhood scale. And so when I read that quote, when I've studied some of the, the work, this, this idea, this word tactical really resonated with me um, about 15 years ago. And when you look at the definition of tactical, it's of or relating to small scale projects that serve a larger purpose, right? So it's not about the tactic, it's about what it's trying to achieve in the long term or adroit in planning or maneuvering to accomplish a purpose. So tactical urbanism then is an approach to community building that uses short term, low cost and scalable projects that are intended to catalyze long term change. And I think a lot of this has to start with giving people a positive experience. You, know, you can show them pretty pictures like I just did from Soho in New York City. You can tell them this is better statistically for the environment, but what it comes down to is people need to have the experience of that change and have it be positive. And I learned this lesson while um, living and working in Miami uh, more than a decade ago, I got involved with advocating for transforming um, one of the main streets in the downtown of the city and city center into what you see here just for a day and doing that on a monthly basis and having that impact and seeing people out there using the streets in a completely different way actually had a much bigger impact on people's minds and what they want to see in their city and on this street than any sort of planning process that I had been involved in up to that point. So what's very interesting is that sort of initial work back in 2008 
2009 has now culminated in what you see on the left, which is a, a, a rendering, and on the right is the street under construction. And so that same street is being transformed into a much more pedestrian friendly uh, boulevard where it can be closed off to vehicular traffic at certain times of the day for events, you know, days of the week, et cetera, and provides a flexibility, but really treats the street more like a public space than as a corridor for moving large numbers of vehicles. And so this is really tactical urbanism in a nutshell is how you go from the short term and the you know, one day to the long-term transformation. So it's all about short-term action for long-term change. And in this process, we are able to engage and see lots of different people um, deliver the project. So it's not just top-down, it's not just bottom-up, really successful tactical initiatives involve city councilors and municipal government, mayors, developers, entrepreneurs, businesses, you know, advocates, activists, neighborhood organizations, who all have a role to play in making our cities more livable. And this is a, a technique that we think pulls together all those different entities uh, to help deliver physical change and physical experiences that are positive in our cities. So we advocate for this sort of um, iterative approach where it's not about thinking about, okay, let's just like wait 15 or 20 or 30 years to build something permanent that's very expensive. Let's start with something small that tests out the idea and the concept that gets all the different actors in the city engaged in experiencing that change, learn from it, collect data, and then take what you learn and improve it. And so what you see there on the right, that column, that's how most city planning gets done. It's thinking about the big infrastructure and the long-term projects. And really that misses an opportunity to think about project delivery and transformation in these other three different phases of work. So demonstration projects are those that are very quick, can be for a day, a few days, very expensive, highly removable materials, whereas a pilot project lasts a bit longer, you can actually collect useful information, data, feedback from the public on performance, and then interim design uses materials that are a little bit more durable that can last several years, but fill that gap between say a successful demonstration or pilot and the investment in the long-term transformation. So we're trying to deliver benefits faster and then learn how those long-term investments should be made to be more successful in the end. And so this whole methodology is about going from just the short and the long term, and then thinking about where to intervene with these different kinds of projects um, prior to the delivery of, of long-term investment. So it allows people to work together in new ways. It's very experiential. Um, it uncovers what works, but more importantly, what is not working in the project. So you don't invest resources in the, into things that are not desired by the public or the community or things that just don't work from a technical perspective. And through this, we build political will and deliver public benefits faster in the end. Uh, on the right there, just a couple images of a project we were involved with in Australia, where there was a transformation of their high street. And you see what it was at the top, what it was in the middle there as sort of an interim project where they made tweaks and changes for about five or six years. And then on the bottom is what it looks like today um, as a pedestrianized corridor. So this sort of idea of iteration and you know constantly improving and tweaking things is something that we've gotten very, very used to, you know, with our, our smartphones and our software, and that we're constantly expecting that next iPhone to come out or the next update for our apps. Um, this is kind of that idea, but applying it to urban planning. Now it's a very different field and very different realities, but like this concept of constantly trying to improve something by by iterating is really important uh, and core to the tactical urbanism methodology. So over you know, the last you know, decade, decade and a half, we've been you know, developing this methodology and improving it ourselves, not just individual projects, but the methodology itself. And starting back in say to the mid 2000s, you know, there's a lot of activity by activists who were going out and making changes with no permission in the middle of the night, um, you know, artistic projects or projects that might be considered illegal or not government sanctioned, but were gaining a lot of support and eventually were being adopted by, by city governments. And that is what got me excited about tactical urbanism and really coming up with the, the, the phrase to apply to those types of, of interventions. But 
very quickly seeing that there needed to be a methodology that professionalized the principles and the concept to allow for a wider application from city governments and city leaders to work very closely with communities and activists to test things out. So around 2014 is when we uh, actually saw the first project uh, tender from a government asking for tactical urbanism, um, which was you know now happens very commonly across the United States and, and elsewhere, but that was the first time we'd seen that happen. And then I'd say around 2017, 2019, kind of taking this idea and scaling it up in terms of project size, project complexity, introducing lots of other placemaking components like you see there in the image in terms of asphalt art um, and uh, spreading this, this sort of methodology to be more long lasting, to fill those gaps between successful short-term projects and long-term transformation. And then finally, you know, um, I'd say from 2020 on with the pandemic and learning from many other applications in the past, really seeing how um, tactical urbanism can be a tool for responding to crisis. And that's something I'll dig into a little bit more uh, in this presentation and thinking about recovery from immediate shocks, right? Uh, an earthquake, you know, war, pandemics, things like that. So as a quick visual, you can see what this might look like in the planning graphic on the left is a plan for a, a very long, corridor in a city called Louisville here in the United States. And on the right is the way that we translated this long-term vision into something that could be built you know, within a year at a fraction of the cost. It takes a lot of the ideas and the principles and the concepts, but it translates it into something that could be done much, much faster. So before I get into a couple of case studies, I'm just gonna share um, kind of the range of applications of tactical urbanism. As I mentioned, you know, it kind of started as a way to instigate change from an activist perspective. Um, you can see on the left there, sort of unsanctioned and sanctioned projects that are done very, very quickly and cheaply and are trying to make a point or to make you know, a, a change politically to accept the idea of even something being possible. Um, but as the, as the practice has evolved, we see that it can be very much you know, a tool to engage communities during a planning process. When you're thinking about what to do with this vacant land, what to do with this street, what to do in this neighborhood, you can use physical projects to help engage people in having that conversation. When you make a quick change on a street, people notice it in their daily life, will give you feedback, they'll talk to you, they'll give you input that can be really useful in thinking about um, a longer term planning effort. You can also take those you know, sort of quick physical projects and you can apply them after a plan has been adopted. So you go through a whole planning process, you don't wanna see that momentum lost, you want to kind of take some of the ideas in the plan and get them on the ground and start testing them. It's a very useful methodology for that. Um, number four, I'll speak to this in a few minutes, but pilot, pilot projects as a sort of capital planning tool, right? Trying to figure out what to spend those big resources on. Uh, number five, testing specific materials. There's always materials that are sort of changing and technologies that are changing in our built environment. And these kinds of projects become really good ways to experiment and do that in a very measured and intentional way to really understand what works and what doesn't physically in any given location in a city. We've worked a lot with universities and academics to kind of study the impact of these projects from a sort of an academic perspective. And so really setting up key metrics and thinking about how you would measure and evaluate um, the changes that are made. Uh, we've done that a few different ways uh, with partners over the years, and it can be a really useful tool for like really getting that feedback and understanding academically uh, what's successful and what's not. In many places, there's sort of that seasonal demand change. So number seven, you can accommodate seasonal need and demand by putting things in temporarily and then removing them, say, for the winter season, bringing them back in the spring or summer. And so you can be really flexible with the way your streets and public spaces work from, from that perspective and be very tactical. Um, number eight, to permit these projects, to have policies and programs that support this work. That's really been a missing factor until relatively recently, so that it's easier to do these projects, whether you're a community activist or a student, or you're a professional, or you work for your own city government. Um, having the sort of policies and processes in place to um, streamline the work and make it predictable is something that's really important for it to be replicable be able to do it again and again for different methodology, different uh, types of projects. And then number nine, um, pre-vitalizing a site. Uh, pre-vitalizing to us means 
before you go and build something on say private land, like a new building, you can bring programming and activity to that space with temporary materials to bring economic activity and viability to a site. And then finally, number 10, which we'll speak more about here today is uh, crisis response. You know, how do you recover uh, after a pandemic, a natural disaster, war, et cetera. So I'm gonna share a couple of quick examples of tactical urbanism as it's been practiced in sort of that third stage where we've kind of professionalized it a bit more, had longer lasting projects. And then I'll share a couple of examples of, um, of crisis response. So this is a project in a small city um, of less than 100,000 people. It's called Asheville, North Carolina. And the idea here was that one of their streets in the center of the city was going to be completely reconstructed. But there were some advocates who wanted to really figure out how that street should be redesigned and reconstructed for that long-term investment. So they got it right. So they worked with us and a number of other organizations in the community, sort of develop a design that would take this street and improve it. Now, what's interesting about this context is that a lot of the land use was changing. So there was new development coming in, older buildings and parking lots were being redeveloped into bigger buildings, into art galleries, breweries, you know, creative industries and, and apartments were coming in. And so there was a lot more demand to be on the street. And while we worked with a bike uh, advocacy organization, it became very clear through the engagement that people want more to the street than just a bike lane. They wanted to really be a pedestrian friendly street. And so this is just the, the first version of this project where we um, expanded the sidewalk space and moved the parking off the curb, but used that space against the sidewalk as kind of a flexible space for walking, for scooting, skating, or cycling, and used a material sort of pallet that looked much more about like a public space than like a transportation corridor. That was really the feedback that we got through a lot of the engagement. And so with more than 120 different volunteers, we built this um, change into the street over a long weekend. And in the middle of the street, it included this very large mural. And the idea with this was that we could close off this one block to traffic for events. And it becomes much more like a square or a plaza um, when that street is closed to traffic. But then when it's open to traffic, you could park on it, as you can see, you know, with the parking spaces delineated, and you could drive down the street just like you would normally, um, but it would have that level of flexibility built into it. And it would also bring this sort of, you know, energy and, um, and beauty to the project, um, you know, right in the heart of, of the corridor. So like any project, we, we measure and we evaluate. Um, so we did a lot of analysis and collecting of data with the city. And I think primarily what was really important um, to do is to slow down people who are driving. And so what we learned was this project reduced speeding on the street. Um, two out of every three cars were speeding prior to the intervention. After the intervention, one out of five were speeding. And you can see there that the high, highest speeds before the project was installed were very high. Um, and we really reduced that dramatically after the project was implemented. And in terms of vehicles, there's still the same number of cars that were traveling on the street. We also worked with an organization called State of Place, and they use 205 um, different variables to analyze the quality of the public space and the public realm. And they did their analysis on the street before and after. And so the index score went from a 42 up to almost a 72, um, which is a really large change. And what they saw was that you know, they use a lot of their data points to um, predict economic impact and economic improvement. And they saw that the benefit was $3.5 million of increased value created um, with a very large return on the investment of, of $23.40 for every dollar spent installing the project. So to us, this means that the sort of changes and improvements that were made would have a very large sort of economic impact, both in the short term and the long term um, when, when the street is permanently redesigned. But at the end of the day, you know, seeing smiling faces and kids using the street and the, and the public space activated and people happy, that's, you know, that's the most important data point. I think that tells us all we truly need to know. But of course, you know, we, we do a lot more of the analysis to make, um, you know, bigger arguments, but this really does make the point. 
Um, one more example, this is a very recent project in California, um, in Los Angeles, in a place called Culver City. Um, this is a project that took 1.3 miles of a major boulevard and um, was intending to test out the removal of a lot of vehicle travel lanes, and in some cases, parking. And the idea was to make it much more pedestrian friendly, make it a lot easier to take the bus and to speed up the bus and to make um, you know, scooters and cycling a lot safer and more appealing to people. Um, and what the project entailed was basically a one year timeline of both planning, design, and then implementation. And the budget was $1.5 million, um, which sounds like a lot, but when it comes to big infrastructure transformation projects for streets of this, of this length, it's actually a very, very small uh, amount of money. So the different project components was installing a bus lane so that buses only would travel in that lane, uh, protected bike lanes and enhancements for people walking and cycling, um, improving the bus stop experience, as you can see in the lower left. And then what we call the placemaking components was all the, all the public art. And so our firm worked on a variety of iterations, as you can see here, to come up with the palette uh, for the murals of which there were more than uh, 30,000 square feet of murals in terms of space that was painted for pedestrians. Um, and what you see there on ultimately on the right represents some of the um, different plants and species that are found along a nearby creek in this city, so a body of water. So just to get to it, here's what the corridor looked like in the downtown of Culver City um, before, and then what it looked like after. So you can see that how much space was given back to bus transit, to cycling, and to walking. Here's an image of what it looked like on Google before on Culver Boulevard. Here's what it looked like after. So 0% given to sustainable transportation modes, and then 63% of space given over to sustainable transportation modes, being walking, cycling, and the bus. So you can just see how these transformations help to improve mobility for those who are not driving. And what we learned um, through working with the community to install the project, uh, celebrating the project, and then collecting a lot of data, which you know, we're issuing these monthly reports, which you can read at the, the Move Culver City website, is that um, there was a huge increase in transit ridership um, compared to post-COVID. It's important to think about post and pre-COVID, but um, from the depths of the pandemic to the project's installation, a lot of transit use went up. Um, a lot more cycling that increased 85% from pre-pandemic levels. We actually had data from before the pandemic to compare it to. The buses were on time almost 90% of the time. Uh, car travel times were actually improved. So people were tra traveling by vehicle 9% uh, faster. Uh, but the same number of vehicles we're still traveling along this major corridor. And so what we're seeing is that we're getting a lot more efficiency in the street because the way we designed it was for much more efficient, efficient bus operations, uh, cycling and walking, et cetera. And it just freed up um, more predictability for vehicles. And so big change physically, but no impact to through traffic. So those are two kind of examples on how we think about transforming the public realm, transforming streets for more improved um, use, but there's also this notion of taking tactical urbanism and applying it to very challenging situations in terms of the physical environment, uh, the ecological environment, and we started working on what we have coined as tactical resilience back in 2016 with an initiative called 100 Resilient Cities, which was funded by the Rockefeller Foundation here in New York, but onboarded 100 cities around the globe to uh, develop a resilient strategy, and then to go implement those strategies um, at the highest level of city governance. And so we worked with um, six cities of the 100 over about three years time, developing a wide variety of initiatives that would take local issues such as flooding or lack of trust in government or the need to create clear policy and develop projects with communities to help deliver those on the ground to respond directly and quickly to either the stresses for communities from a resilience perspective or their shocks. 
And so I think that sort of work uh, relates to and reflects back to crisis response. And here's a really compelling and fascinating example of how you respond to a sudden shock uh, to a city. This is you know, Christ Church, New Zealand, which back in 2010 and 2011 had a series of earthquakes that um, destroyed a large swath of the city center and uh, a number of neighborhoods where people lived. 185 people died um, in the largest earthquake. And there was a need to immediately build back the city to be viable. But the challenge is that governments don't move very fast, right? Um, once this sh the, the earthquake happened, there was a need to connect. There was a need for social space, for religious space, places to play. Uh, there was a need for commerce. But there was so much rubble and so much destruction that the, the, the government was moving on its own sort of timeline, whereas students, residents, activists organized themselves much more quickly and immediately started using the, the rubble from the earthquake and cleaning up and then repurposing materials and spaces to be viable um, places to kind of rebuild the city. And doing that at a sort of a small, incremental, very inexpensive and experimental way. So really, this is a wonderful example of tactical urbanism applied to crisis response. And here on the left there, you see uh, a public space kind of in transition. And then on the right, four years later, what it wound up being rebuilt as taking the wisdom and the input from that more interim and temporary version and um, carrying through those lessons into the final design. So I think you know some of the principles um, from Christchurch and from this response can certainly apply to a number of different types of communities dealing with crisis now in, in Ukraine. Um, and I think maybe step one, and you know, these, these principles are not in any particular order, but certainly step one is to memorialize and remember who and what was in place before the destruction happened. I think we have to heal as people, as, as a society, before we can really truly move forward. And the acts of implementing these memorials is a way to, to heal and start to move beyond what the crisis was that caused the shock in the first place. And so on the upper left there, you see an artist uh, installation on a vacant lot where a building was destroyed by the earthquake. And all these white seats represent one of the 185 people who died in the earthquake. Um, so from that to lighting up historic heritage buildings that were not fully destroyed, but in need of um, reinvestment and repair to just simply putting up an image of what was in that vacant space and having plaques to remember what was uh, before, you know, for example, this square got rebuilt, that permanent version. Um, focusing recovery efforts on, you know, truly symbolic civic spaces, whether that's the main square um, or parks or places where people um, gather that they think of as a symbolic place for the whole city. Um, that's something that Christ Church did very quickly. This is their uh, cathedral square. You can see the you know, main cathedral in the city was uh, partially destroyed. And one of the first things that got rebuilt was, was the square. Um, so I think investing permanently, if you do it anywhere, once your core infrastructure, water, electricity, you know, internet is restored, thinking about the public realm, what we all share together as residents of a town or a city and investing there, even before private buildings get redeveloped is really, really critical. Um, this is a playground that was rebuilt uh, in Christ Church and has become a true center of the, of the community. But, you know, these kinds of big in interventions take time, take money and resources. And so really focusing on small projects, things that, you know, groups of individuals can do um, to bring, um, again, repurpose rubble, bring that the spaces to be more lively, to be able to sit, to be able to enjoy, just kind of reimagine and rethink what a space could become. And part of that is, you know, can be done by growing food. You know, this is something that brings people together in every single culture. Um, you know, being able to celebrate together and using public space to not just grow the food, but to eat the food together. And something can start to the sort of the healing process and it can provide spaces for entrepreneurs and bring skill sets into the public realm that is useful for recovery. In a related way, bringing back or expanding greenery. A lot of our cities have been paved over um, to their detriment for a very long time. So when we think about resilient cities, about ecological cities, you know, thinking about how the destruction 
of a city that happens quickly can actually allow you to build it back better and more green and bring you know an environmental uh, angle back into the city that would, would have been much more difficult to do if it had the crisis and destruction not occurred. We need commerce. That commerce can be temporary, it can be mobile, it can be flexible. It's like think about everything from pop-up tents to containers to um, you know small structures that can bring back um, the, the ability to shop. It gives people who are entrepreneurs the ability to have a place to sell their food or their goods in a way that would take much longer for permanent buildings to be reconstructed. And so this can help animate vacant spaces. Um, they can be very temporary or interim means to get commerce flowing again in the city once it's been destroyed. Um, these aren't the best images of, of these streets, uh, unfortunately, as it took them during the colder months. But you know, thinking about safer and more inviting streets, building those back better as well, thinking about bringing expanded pedestrian space, places for transit, places to sit and walk that are safer and more inviting, always has an economic impact uh, that is positive. And so these are the kinds of changes Christ Church took on very quickly uh, in terms of making some of their streets car free or expanding their pedestrian space. Um, art as a way to activate and heal, um, just many, many examples of, of murals and um, improvements that were made all around the city in various ways, um, including festivals that brought people back to the center of the city, working with makers and artists and architects, um, designers, artists, etc. And then you know, recovering spiritual space. Um, on the bottom right there, you see um, what's called the cardboard cathedral. It was designed by a very famous Japanese architect um, and a very temporary structure that was popped up very quickly to give people in Christ Church a place to go uh, to worship uh, as a number of their churches, including the cathedral that was the center of the city, was destroyed and unusable as part of the earthquake. And then finally, create time and space to play. You know, games bring people together, you know, clearing out space, temporary parks, you know, plazas, this is a way to animate and bring life back into the city and to our public spaces uh, quickly in a way that brings a lot of joy and in a way that can be very, very inexpensive. So I'm gonna conclude the, the presentation uh, with just some lessons learned from the pandemic being another crisis that unlike the war in Ukraine or the earthquake in, um, uh, in Christchurch in New Zealand, is something that's been felt in uh, different ways, but has been felt globally for the last uh, two plus years. So when the pandemic hit, obviously thinking about space, particularly in dense cities like a Kiev, right, is was so critical. And if we have to stay apart, that's really hard to do in an urban setting. Um, you know, to that degree, um, people thought that cities were going to be dead, that if you can't live close together, you can't work close together, you can't even walk on the street close together, you know, what, what purpose is a city actually serve. Now, I think we all know this not to be true, but uh, this was where people's you know, minds were at in, in early 2020, as the pandemic was still bearing down on, on New York, on the United States, and some other places around the world. But I think what was fascinating is that so many different cities around the globe turned to tactical urbanism as a way to create more space by repurposing you know, sidewalks and streets in a variety of ways to allow for space to be given back and for restaurants and businesses to begin or to continue operating um, and trying to keep the economy moving forward, but also as a way to kind of deliver public services outdoors. Um, so there's less of a threat to transmission. So a lot of our work um, early in the pandemic was about tracking these changes and then documenting them and then working with different organizations to share those best practices on how to quickly adapt streets and public spaces for things like critical services, protests, which we had a lot of in the United States during the pandemic, through this whole sort of catalog of ways that streets could be reimagined to serve, you know, um, a lot of different functions during the pandemic, but also to learn from those functions so that moving forward as we rebuild and we recover from the pandemic, we have better streets and better public spaces and better cities. And so you can see how that tactical methodology can be used for response and can be used for recovery. Um, there's a great database that sort of our information that we were collecting and, and others was sort of um, amalgamated into and it documents more than 400 cities and 45 countries 
that use those sort of six core tactics. It's kind of interesting that really with all these cities across the world, it kind of came down to five or six ways that they adapted the environment. Um, and then, you know, all the different ways in terms of applications that was uh, applied across, across the globe. And so quickly lessons learned, you know, lowering the barrier to entry, just allowing people to, to trade or to serve food or to sit uh, outdoors. This used to be a very bureaucratic process in a place like New York. It happened almost overnight by just getting away, you know, doing away with some of the regulations that were onerous. It allowed us to codify more flexibility into our streets. Um, to allow them to be used in different ways based on the month of the year, day of the week, time of the day. Here you can see an example where these uh, barricades kind of can telescope in and out, sometimes allowing traffic, sometimes not, allowing a great flexibility for the street. Uh, we've learned that you know you can't just throw up a bunch of construction you know materials and have people love those spaces. You really have to evolve those materials, make them more beautiful over time. Yes, this is what was on hand for a lot of communities during the early days of the pandemic, but they don't really wear very well and they are really sort of anti-pedestrian. They look like you're not supposed to be there as a human. And so thinking about the materials palette is actually quite critical as you think about sort of more interim and longer term um, uses of your streets as they evolve into permanence. We found there's a lot of value that was created by using streets differently. So um, all these restaurants having expanded places to serve food, create a real sort of micro boom for those restaurants, which actually resulted in more tax revenue um, being created, more revenue than, than was being uh, created with, um, with just parking on the street. So we saw almost a 500% increase in revenue that was generated by dining over parking. So seeing how that economic benefit could translate to policy longer term in repurposing parking space for dining space, that's something that we've done in New York and made that permanent and been made permanent in many cities around the world with that sort of economic trade-off being seen as a benefit. Um, learning that not every neighborhood is the same and that people respond to these types of changes very differently. So really understanding that social context is more important than just the physical context. So really working with people to adapt the materials, interventions to really serve what their immediate needs are while staying true to the sort of principles of flexibility, low cost, quick sort of changes in the, in the public realm. A lot of these temporary measures, I think, were not initially viewed as being ones that would be permanent, but um, many of them have been as we've, as we've learned over the years. And so planning for success is very important, being prepared to build on that success um, and thinking about how you transition temporary projects into more permanence. Uh, here you see in Paris on the left, a temporary bike lane that was installed during the pandemic. And on the right, you can see that being upgraded with permanent infrastructure to be a protected bike lane on the street. But also as you plan for success, plan for failure. Not every project is going to work. Not every retailer is going to succeed. Not every you know temporary public space will attract people. And so really doing that sort of analysis and thinking through and being open to failure is really a key part of the methodology. Uh, here's an example from a town we worked with, a very small town here in the United States where they wanted to transform their streets for the pandemic. And a lot of it was not well received. And so the mayor wound up removing this project um, after about two and a half weeks when it was meant to be there for one year's time. And so really being prepared to think about conflict, about the political process and how to be responsive to that um, and how actually these short-term projects, well, controversial sometimes. Actually, this has led to the city rethinking it once this was removed. They actually have rethought it and want this to come back in a more permanent way. So long-term success can happen as long as you go through the ups and downs and process of, of change making, which can be messy. Uh, number eight, resilient streets are absolutely resilient communities. That's what, you know, we all share our streets, whether we're driving, taking the bus, walking, cycling, sitting, hanging out. Um, if we have resilient streets, we'll have resilient communities. And finally, the biggest barrier to success in rebuilding our communities is us, right? We need to make these things easy. We need to make them accessible to entrepreneurs. We need to really be flexible in how we approach rebuilding um, and be open to sort of that continuous iterative process that makes our cities dynamic and livable and healthy. So with that, I'll just leave you with this quote. You know, our brain tends to remember 10% of what it reads. Uh, so if you read one of our books, great if you remember 10% of it, 20% of what it hears, 
So if you take 20% away from this talk of what I told you today, great, but 90% of what it does or simulates. So tactical urbanism is all about the doing to get to lasting long-term change, to understand it viscerally for the long-term. So no, New York is not dead forever. Uh, come visit us. Our city is very much alive. Um, we're very excited about the, the energy that's been restored in New York City. Like any city, you can come back from destruction. Cities are extremely resilient as proven over, you know, thousands and thousands of years. Um, you know, Kiev and many other cities across um, Ukraine will be the same. Um, so I'm hoping that some of these lessons today and principles can be uh, applied. And if you want more resources, you can certainly go to our website uh, or the tacticalurbanismguide.com website. You can download and access a lot of the resources that we put together, many of which have been partnered with um, different people from around the world, including Italy, Australia, New Zealand, South America. We work a lot internationally to help translate these principles into different cultural um, and geographical contexts. So I think with that, we'll just open it up to any questions or conversation. Thank you. Many thanks, Mike. So um, as uh, you were going through your slides, one of the first slides was saying, you know, that 80% of the plans never get uh, implemented. I think uh, one of the interesting lessons in Eastern Europe is that 80% of the st stuff that gets implemented was never planned okay. <laughs> or discussed. Um, and, you know, this is in a sense, a, 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 a perhaps an additional challenge because, you know, you're showing community engagement and so on and so forth. And to, to a good degree, communities have only recently have received a voice uh, so that they understand that it, their voice is not just about voting every four years uh, for parliament elections or presidential elections or every five years, whatnot, but it's actually going there every second week, third week the city hall and, and engage in these kind of things. So I think it's it's going to be a bit of a, a longer road on, on that. Um, but again, you know, um, during a war, we have to do sorts things very, very differently in a sense. Right. And um, this crisis element that wars bring about um, can prove, uh, yeah, you know, uh, can, can open up new ways to do things. Um, I think this is this is one of the things we take away um, with many things that were done by companies also that had to adapt very very fast and, and so on and so forth. Um, so, okay, um, let me just quickly. Okay, somebody's asking about presentation PowerPoint. Um, somebody's yeah talking about the real war. Um, great presentation and idea. So no no immediate questions. If the audience is uh, thinking about questions, uh, please uh, you know uh, write them in the chat. In in the meantime, so Mike, I, I wanted to ask you. For example, you showed us this. I think it was LA that had both uh, public transport and so public transit buses and and bikes. Um, and to a, to a good degree, uh, bikes, scooters, and so on and so forth. It's at the end of the day, sort of a consumer choice. How do you how do you sort of a read the market before to know that it makes sense to dedicate that very expensive real estate to these two different ways of, of transportation? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, to be honest, we don't always know if that demand is there. That's partially the reason for the experiment. I think we know that uh, cities need to have less emissions. Um, and be more to be more sustainable. To do that, you need people traveling with modes of travel that don't pollute. And so, scooters, walking, biking, and also the bus are primary ways to do that in most places. Um, but the conditions for taking the bus or for cycling, for example, are usually not very good. They're very they feel unsafe, or a bus gets stuck in traffic, so you can walk faster than the bus. And so this is about trying out, privileging those modes, giving more space for those ways to get around and seeing what happens. And what we've learned in Culver City and most other places is there's a, you know, there's a latent demand for those choices if the quality of that experience is provided. Um, and so our, you know, our results from the Culver City experiment has been you know, very positive in that regard that more people are choosing those modes than before. Um, because the experience is better. So, so the principle applies still that you know you try it out. If many people 
go with a bike lane that's temporary, then as in the Parix example, you would, you would turn into something that is a protective lane or it's you know, somehow removed from intense traffic and then allows. Uh... Uh, the other question I had is, you know, you showed this very interesting example of uh, uh, restaurants increasing their, uh, so generally retailers increasing their sales. Uh, but um, of course, this depends by street, by uh, uh, neighborhood. You know, traffic sort of uh, calms down in certain parts of, of the city during the night, but restaurants come to life. Uh, residents of those buildings, were they happy with it? I mean, how does this, mm -hmm. of course, you, you, you get perhaps better food and so on and so forth, but it almost changes very much the, the function uh, of the city. I mean, you move to a neighborhood because it's quiet, then all of a sudden it's no longer quiet. Yeah, there's been a lot of that, um, those dynamics playing out in New York and I'm sure many other cities um, with a big increase in outdoor dining, not just outdoor dining, but also <clears throat> drinking. So um, in uh, very dense neighborhoods with a lot of nightlife, the increase of activity outdoors has been, I think, frustrating for a number of residents. Um, in other places, it's been far less of a problem in, in New York. And so it kind of depends on which neighborhood you're in and how sensitive you are to that issue. I think a lot of people understood that in the depths of the pandemic, that it was a necessary challenge to allow restaurants to do this. Now that we've moved into a different phase of the pandemic, um, there are people who are starting to complain. In fact, there's even a lawsuit against the city's permanent program to allow it. So like I said at the beginning, streets are political. Not everyone has the same opinion about how they should be used. Um, I think we've seen their, the flexibility of streets, which is great. And I think overall, the outdoor dining is very positive for the city, but you got to think through, I think, some of the regulations on, uh, you know, how long can they operate outdoors at night? You know, what's reasonable given the density of restaurants or bars or the kind of community that it is, is very important. But at the end of the day, you know, if it's, if it's you're living someplace and it's too loud, you know, you, you're also free to move and the next person to take that apartment will be very, could be very excited that they're living on top of that. So, you know, the market kind of will sort itself out over time, even though there might be a lot of complaints and upset people throughout that process. Um, this though sort of us, um, um, in a sense, changes the neighborhood quite a lot. I mean, I, I don't know if we can say that it, it overflows in rents, but uh, higher retail and so on and so forth tends to push prices of uh, houses and rents as well. Uh, and this maybe is a side effect that benefits those who are already in, but not necessarily those who would like to move in. 100%. That's exactly okay. what we're seeing in New York. I mean, it's more expensive than it's ever been. Um, we, you know, quite frankly, it's, it's not something that I would blame on outdoor dining or, you know, quality public space being built. I would blame it on the lack of housing that gets built. Mm -hmm. Um, and so we have a huge undersupply of affordable housing and just housing of all types, um, across, across the city and a growing population still. So despite what, you know, we all thought in the pandemic that New York's population was going to completely deflate. We now know that not to be true. Um, and I'm sure it's the case in many places where um, you know, there's just not enough being built to satisfy the demand in the market. And that's a major problem yeah, yeah. that plays out. And you know, it's, it's interesting because a lot of people in wealthier neighborhoods are also working from home in a way they weren't before the pandemic. So those who are office workers and don't need to go in every day. Um, you know, I live in a neighborhood where the restaurants now are very, very busy at lunchtime. And they were never that busy before because there's a lot more people around the neighborhood in the middle of the day who walk down the street to get lunch. Mm -hmm. um, so that's positive for those businesses, but it also creates, you know, this, this attraction and like a lot of people want to be in that kind of environment. So again, whether you're the new restaurant trying to rent the space or you're the resident trying to move in and rent or buy, it's it's more expensive. So if you if you add open air gyms, you're going to kill the office, basically. This is what you're saying. <laughs> I don't think we'll kill the office, but we're, we're definitely seeing a very different version of the office for some segments of the population, that's for sure. So there's two questions that I'm going to sort of emerge. It's Alexander and Carly who are asking, where do you start in this uh, stakeholder uh, diagram uh, you showed us? And then once you start, how do you sort of uh, combine what you want to do with the local regulation, which puts, as you mentioned, many limits in, yeah. in this process? My advice is to always start very small, you know, start with a small group of people, start with one business owner, 
and you yourself or a small group of advocates um, who want to make a change that would benefit um, the public space or the public realm or the business. Don't think about you know miles of streets or whole neighborhoods. That gets very complicated and challenging very quickly. But if you start one small experiment, see how it goes, you kind of learn some fluency with that project. And then you can kind of take on something that's more complex, go to a different location. You can expand or you know grow it or contract it based on what you learn. Um, and so if you start small, it can then grow bigger from there. Um, so it's, it's pretty daunting and scary to start with a large scale project, even if it's temporary. So start small and grow from there is my advice. Um, you know, a lot of times regulations don't support those small things. And so you can either choose to do it anyways, um, which crisis allows a lot more flexibility in that oftentimes. There's no one necessarily in a crisis, you know, able to fall through on regulations or, or track things. And so if you can prove something that works, that's not typically allowed, it becomes a working example that is very convincing oftentimes to become allowed and be legalized moving forward. And that's, again, a good example is the outdoor dining, but many other experiments in public space over the last you know, 15 or 20 years, I've seen kind of go through that trajectory where it's, it seems like it's, on, it's not allowed and it's out of the box. But all of a sudden it's very popular and people want to see it happen. And so there's now political will sort of change the policy of the regulations to allow it to happen more frequently. All right, uh, many thanks, uh, Mike. So we're getting close to the, uh, to the end of our, uh, of our uh, presentation. Um, I don't know, I hope I'll be able to, just as you welcome us to visit New York, to, to be able to welcome you uh, to this give and the and, and round. Um, um, uh, as mentioned, you know, this is a series of talks uh, that we're where we're trying to create a platform for urbanists in, in Ukraine to look at, at new ideas, fresh ideas. And I think you've given us a lot of uh, interesting projects that have worked in different countries uh, that shows that, that, you know, this is not a unique case that's only U.S. experience uh, uh, working in, in, in a U.S. Uh, setting. Um, as you mentioned, there were some uh, documents. I'll probably just write to you afterwards because I would be interested to see, you know, some of these uh, updated tactical urbanism PD, uh, uh, manuals, so, so to say, just to see how, how things uh, are set. If there's anything on, on your end, uh, let me know. Otherwise, many, many thanks again, and I hope we keep in touch. Yes, thanks for having me, really appreciate it. Take care. Great, thanks, have a nice day. Okay, See bye -bye. you, bye.